Tell me about the massives, Maxwell said to the Goslian xenobiologist. The bird creatures were a curious lot, very avian in their traits right down to their feathers, and to his eyes they had similar short-term family structures to some bird species of Earth. They mated for a few years, then most of them parted ways when their young were grown. It was still a wonder to the xenobiologists of Earth that other species could develop advanced societies with the structures they had. But they were a friendly race, and had been quick as the Kalanians under Galen to offer ships to help patrol the new human colonies. News back home was strongly pro-alien and pro-confederation. Sore points remained over the Zalia, but the cooperative face-saving move of to allow it to be portrayed as a misunderstanding between alien species helped smooth things over. I should probably feel worse about the few pank in the Zalia finished off, but that is hard to let go of, and I would have to be something of a hypocrite to cry for them now. The thought came and went from the ex-admiral. The new grand presider was being advised by the first grand presider to lead humanity to the stars, and James Stoneworth Jackson had the sense to ensure that the new one, presider did not forget that the Zalia taught humanity another lesson. We cannot expect mercy from the Zalia. Any war we fight will only be fought once. In the eyes of the higher-ups, the Zalia were potentially worse than the Pankin. But the Zalia queen showed sense and chose the peaceful option, whether she understood that she had taught humanity new lessons about her people or not was anybody's guess. But now the massives had all the eyes of the confederation and the smaller, less affiliated groups, including the Zalian Empire, turned their way. The massives are a species evolved from a kind of biological igneous. Our study of their earliest evolution shows that they are descended from a kind of well, if you can imagine a moss made of sand that incorporated rocks into their structure, it bonded with their SNA. Uh, they're a silicone based life form, quite unique. How? Maxwell asked. They reproduce very slowly, but because they require no food, feasting on rocks, they never had an agricultural period. Instead, they settled around mountains rather than by rivers as humans did, mostly active volcanoes. Their social structure is centered on dividing up mineral rights. Since their young grow stronger based on what kind of minerals they consume, they banded together to fight over mineral rights. That sounds very human, Maxwell thought, bemused, and the xenobiologist looked at him with confusion for a moment, until Maxwell waved it away. Forget it. Ask one of your specialists in humanity why I find the analogy funny. The Goslian cocked his head for a moment, then bobbed it and went on. They're hard to kill, and so their wars were never too destructive compared to ours, or even yours. And because they are so hard to kill, and because they have not developed a cultural aversion to it, they are more willing to wage it. They look for ideal mineral worlds and plant colonies there. This seldom brings them into competition with others. But over the years, their empire has slowly begun running out of space. You're kidding? Maxwell asked. No. Their civilization is very old, and their core worlds are heavily populated. The weakness of their species is that rocks... Well, you can't really grow more of them. They've consumed their asteroid belts. There are no mountains left on their core worlds, and they eat a great deal. Their bodies are almost two meters tall, and twice as wide as one of you when full-grown. They are looking to relocate entire worlds, and there are not many suitable for that which are not occupied. Why not just send out massive... Oh, Maxwell stopped and the Goslian bobbed his head. They can't exactly grow food on the ship, can they? They've reached the limit of their jump drive capability to resupply their ships, and I guess not just any rocks will do. Exactly. The Goslian bobbed his head rapidly. Volcanic rock and some other materials are good. Some others like iron or nickel, planetary cores, and silicone based. They could even live on sand but they wouldn't live well. We know they sent out several ships, but we never caught any transmissions coming back after they ventured far beyond the known areas. We believe they starved in the void. Divided by entire systems as much as by species, it was still a horrible death to think about, dying in the abyss of hunger. So they're becoming aggressive, because if they don't, they won't last. Maxwell replied again, 
pity in his breast for the unfortunate massives. It gets worse, the Goslian xenobiologist replied. They understand that blood has iron in it, and bones are calcium-based, and many races are made of carbon. Simply put, about 3% of our bodies are made of metals. As my colleague tells me, 2.5% of human bodies are the same. Other races have similar proportions, with the Exalians having around 5%. Maxwell's face turned faintly green. So they want to what? Turn us all into food sources and raise us as such? He asked. The xenobiologist refuted that immediately. No, an intelligent race is a bad model for that. This is not one of your world's science fiction films. Rather, they want to use unintelligent animals for that, and other races are simply in the way, and they have worlds ready to be used for armies. They attacked one small world, found an unintelligent species that had a biomass of 15% metallic elements of their most nutritious sort. They exterminated that world's inhabitants and began raising the discovered animal the way your species does sheep or cattle. So, if they were to remove the intelligent life from their path, the sentence did not need to be completed. I understand. Wipe a few species out, turn their worlds into ranches, and consume the material of those worlds to survive until you can create large harvests. They could empty their dying worlds very easily that way. And now they're on the Goslian border, Maxwell answered. You understand completely. Now what do you propose to do? I prepared for war, thinking I would end up fighting on our borders. I hope the other confederation and non-member worlds recognize that it is far, far better to fight on the far borders of our neighbors rather than on their own. But tell me this. Do you think the massives will reconsider the military option if they're confronted by a united quadrant? He asked the xenobiologist, who went very quiet. If they have any other option, I think so, he answered. Diplomacy is the art of saying nice doggy while looking for a rock. Maxwell said while pacing the floor, he was not in the assembly hall at that moment before the Kalanian Council. Rather, he was in his office on a ship while headed back toward Earth for a conference. But in front of him, a body-scanning projector was monitoring his image and displaying it on the council floor and to the many monitors of absent members, and unique in the last century and a half, non-members. That is a saying on my world, and if it helps, doggies are predators we eventually tamed. He held his hands behind the small of his back while he paced. His pacing motion kept their eyes following him, focused on him. The ambush predator nature of most species in the Confederation meant that abundant motion kept them easily focused. He turned his steely eyes, the false left one glinting with literal steel that was off-putting and even intimidating to those whose bodies could not handle implants, directly at the camera. As you know, I am going back to Earth to speak face to face with the current Grand Presider, and I am transmitting this communication on open comm lines so that the massives themselves can listen if they wish. War is a terrible thing, even if you think you are hard to kill, and even if you win, there is a terrible price to be paid. It is for that reason that I spoke with peace before the Zalian Queen, and it is for that reason that I sought flockhood, brotherhood, nesthood, egghood and bonds of trust with all the species of the Confederation, and more besides. I sent word to the Massive's ambassadors that if they stand down and if they withdraw their fleet six jumps from the border, I would exercise the authority of my office to veto any war proposal. We will not strike first. However, if the Goslians are struck, I will propose a common war by all members of the Quadrant. And if a small planet, if an outpost, if the Zalia, if the Pankin, if any in this quadrant are struck, I will move for a general declaration of war by the entire quadrant, with a common public treaty proclaiming that no one planet or people will make peace independent of the rest. He let that silence stretch to be taken in. He looked away, the stars at his back seeming so endless and beautiful, a common bond to most of the races he knew. They found the stars to be beautiful. If the massives will withdraw the fleet, he held out his hands, stretched together and cupped with palms up in an approximation of a gesture familiar to the massives to signal openness, I will propose a large-scale relief effort. 
We will help supply the resources you need, allocate unoccupied moons and planetoids, and other environments to help you propagate the species of animal that will help you survive. The animal life with proper resources which are not consumable by us, we can trade to you. This is the chance for peace. Take it. Because we already have many rocks ready to use if the government of the massives should choose the path of war. Zalian Homeworld The queen had no counsel, for the Zalia were like one, and yet that did not make her burden less. The humans will fight with us. The Confederation will fight with us. What a very strange thing. She thought, and yet it was not lost on her that this routine of cooperation had yielded the Confederation a superabundance of strength that forced her to reconsider her early plans for conflict. So she tried her best to incorporate this new knowing into her way of seeing the universe. It was no easy thing, and as she sorted her mind through the many signals of her race on her worlds, she found an analogy. A swarm fights as one, but there are many drones. Their cooperation is like making many drones into one while keeping different minds, like every one of them is a queen unto themselves. It was still bizarre, but having hit upon it, with the first massive fleets moving closer to the outlying neighbor systems, and the memory of the way the quadrant hemmed her in still fresh in her mind, she embraced it with the fervor of a religious convert. She made her transmission not long after, sending it directly to the entire council. Zalia will support this measure. If one is struck, Zalia will strike back. When all cease to strike, the Zalia will cease to strike. Pankin Homeworld that the demons who destroyed their empire and nearly drove them to extinction were now openly proclaiming their willingness to protect the defenseless homeworlds was not lost on the survivors, and the remaining government sought from this an opportunity. Their own council leaders transmitted a crude but simple offer to the Terran ascendancy. We will raise volunteers to fight in the war, as long as what they are paid can be deducted from our reparations, or we are permitted some small reindustrialization on each world. No answer was immediately forthcoming when word reached Earth, but they knew all they had to do was wait. Goslian Homeworld When word reached the Goslian systems, cheers and pro-Terran sentiment were both soaring higher than the clouds. The reputation of the war apes and their destructive capability eased many a trembling heart along the border worlds. But nowhere was the relief greater than in the office of High Lord Avon. It may be self-interest, but if it's self-interest or true flockhood, as long as they have their ships on the border, that is all I care about. But the real question is, will the massives take this seriously? They've never fought the war apes. They've never seen Terran violence. They have not seen how far the Terrans will go if pressed. The information is there. If they're smart, they'll avoid a war that takes them against an entire quadrant. But then, they've also never lost a war before. And we lost to them once. The harsh truth kept the Goslian High Lord silent. His advisor on the matters of the massives was being truthful, but that did not make it less painful. It all depends on whether or not they see this as strength or weakness. But I think they will see it as strength, the advisor answered. Massive homeworld. Mountain voice. Ignarius grumbled as he looked at the open transmission from the ones the Goslians had dubbed war apes. So, small, little hairless bird, they think we should fear that? His gravelly voice was echoed by the admirals of his fleet and his advisors. I think they play up these war apes to try to make us afraid. I think these other peoples, all are afraid. They unite out of fear, and fear is weakness. Sir, we should at least consider what they are offering. Perhaps we won't save all our numbers if we accept their offer, but if the rest of them are true stone, we will lose fewer than if we fight. The council member to speak was on the smaller side, and this immediately had him somewhat denigrated by the massives in the chamber. The rocky fist of the mountain voice stood up. If we win quickly, then we will lose few. Our ships are big and we have never known defeat. Destroy a few worlds. If we harvest them, then offer peace, the whole will crumble. Sir, the Zalia refrained from fighting the Terran ascendancy. We beat the Zalian incursions, but that doesn't mean it is easy. We still have time. To starve. 
Mountain Voice Ignarius of the Massives said with blunt dismissal. When the rest of the fleet has reached the border, attack the Goslian border stations and worlds. War apes, lizards, insects, Ursinian, none of them matter. Massives tower over all. What after all could threaten us? Nothing. Nothing, I think. The heavy stomping feet in the chamber drowned out the few who dared to object, and war carried the day. Humph. War apes. Stupid name. You are new to the galaxy, and we will teach you to be afraid of it. It was a satisfying feeling to the mountain voice, and he sat back down to absorb the praise that was hurled his way.